aortic insufficiency. So what is this so-called aortic insufficiency and how dangerous is it? Well, it can be quite dangerous. So it is really important to know what it is and how to recognize it. So the aortic insufficiency term is not really explaining what's going on here. You see, it's actually the insufficiency of the aortic valve. Your heart is not really pumping blood into your arteries. It's kind of squeezing it out, right? And once your heart squeezes the blood out, your heart wants to expand back so it can take in new blood that's coming from the lungs, right? However, what if heart actually stops being contracted, right? And all the blood from your arteries comes back into the heart. Then what? Well, that's why you have this so-called aortic valve. You see, this aortic valve is made out of three leaflets, normally three leaflets, and they are supposed to close. Once the blood from your arteries tries to get back into the heart, they're supposed to close and not allow the blood to come back in. They sort of open only in one direction. They let the blood go out, but they don't let it go back in. Right? That's how they close. That actually is not always the case. If the patient has this aortic valve insufficiency, these leaflets are not capable of closing properly. What could possibly cause something like this? Well, there are many diseases that can create a sort of degenerative process in that region, especially in the aortic valve. Also, patient might have been born with this insufficiency. There are two things that I really want to point out. There are bacterias that can cause the inflammation of the inner layers of your heart and also the inflammation of the aortic valve. They can cause this insufficiency as well. Furthermore, your own body can create antibodies in a, in a disease called rheumatic fever. And these antibodies can attack your own tissue. And they can cause this insufficiency as well. So when does this aortic insufficiency appear? Well, aortic insufficiency can appear gradually. In that case, we call it the chronic aortic insufficiency. In a chronic aortic insufficiency, heart has a little bit of time to react to that. And so it does. It experiences the so-called eccentric hypertrophia. That means that heart is dilatating. Now we come to the most important part of this video, and that is how to recognize this. Well, there are many things that one should not ignore. First of all, pain and discomfort in chest. That's the first thing. Second, lack of air and feeling like you cannot take in enough of air, right? Like you're choking, suffocating, so to speak. Also, what can be noticed is that the arteries are pulsing way more than they normally should. And, you know, one would assume while they're pulsating, that means, wow, there, there, there's enough of blood passing through these arteries. Well, not really. You see, you have the systole, that is when your heart is contracted, and it's contracting and it's squeezing the blood out into the arteries. That's when your blood pressure jumps, right? Then your blood pressure should drop, and that is called the diastole. However, if the patient has the aortic valve insufficiency, this blood pressure is going to drop way more because the blood can actually leave the arteries and go back into the heart. As soon as the heart stops being contracted 
and starts being filled with blood, blood is going to leave the arteries and start going back. That's going to cause extreme drop of the blood pressure in your arteries. And these extremes, you're going to feel this spike, like high blood pressure, and then you're going to feel this extremely low blood pressure. And that's why the arteries would appear as if they're, I mean, they would be pulsing much more, but that does not mean that more blood is flowing through these arteries. Other symptoms that might not be so easy to recognize would be the heart rhythm disturbances. Well, for that, you would need an ECG to actually really determine what's going on. We're going to talk about the diagnostics a little bit later. Furthermore, uh, lung edema or patient might feel dizzy because he's simply lacking enough of blood because the blood keeps going back to the heart. So how do we actually diagnose this thing? Well, first things first, listen to patient's symptoms. And if we assume it, then we have to examine it. That's why we do the clinical examination. Well, first things first, we look for these pulsations of big arteries. Then we can listen to the heart. While we listen to the heart with a stethoscope, we expect to hear two tones. Dum, 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 right? These two tones, the first one, is basically the tone that is produced when the heart is contracting and squeezing the blood out. That's like boom. And then we expect to hear the second tone that would be these leaflets of the valve closing, right? Boom, 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 boom. Okay, well, that's not what happens if in a patient with aortic insufficiency. These leaflets do not close properly, so the second sound will sound somewhat different. Furthermore, the blood is coming back in, and we're going to hear that. So that would be like, like that, right? It would be like you would hear the second tone slightly changed because the leaflets cannot really close. And then you would also, along with it, hear blood coming back in. Now that's pretty much what I try to imitate with my mouth, but you really have to hear it. Now, we can also do the ECG echocardiography but more important thing here is then after we properly diagnose it how to treat it and what would patient be comfortable with right diagnostics without treatment don't mean much for the patient so we're really looking right now at okay how can we help what is the next step? Well, I am always, almost always unhappy with the current state of medicine and how we always have to tell the patient, well, we don't know what it could be. We don't know how what, what's really the prognosis. It might be bad. It might be good. Well, for aortic insufficiency, there is usually a clear way how to treat it. And first things first is to tell the heart to slow down a little bit because remember, Heart feels, oh my God, I have to pump so much right now because the brain is not getting enough of blood. I have to pump even more, but the blood keeps coming back in. So we, we have to tell the heart to slow down and take it easy. We also have to reduce this blood pressure somewhat. And that's why we take the AC blockers and also diuretics. Furthermore, the beta blockers. This is the so-called conservative way to treat it, right? And so... Obviously, there is the liberal way. I mean, no, <laughs> no liberal way. There's only conservative way to treat it and surgical way to treat it. So surgically, we can replace the valve and implant a, an artificial valve. We're basically looking at two options here, the biological and the mechanical valve. Both of these have their advantages and disadvantages. For example, biological valve lasts usually around eight years or so. 
but it does not require anticoagulation therapy. Sure, for a short period of time it requires it, but not for the rest of your life. The mechanic valve, however, lasts much longer. We're talking about 20 years. However, it also requires lifelong anticoagulation therapy, as long as you're alive. If you need more help and information about symptoms, then go to symptomsky.com. There you can find experts and our software for symptoms. If you are studying or teaching medicine, then go to anatomsky.com. There you can find these animations and 3D models in software I made.